The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Welcome to Compass, a production of Pioneer Public Television. I'm Les Heen, your host for Compass. This is a weekly discussion of public policy and important issues facing our viewing area. This week, we will look at what's new in the dairy industry around the region. We'll see how farmers are keeping up with demands in the dairy business and working through, well, what could be some challenging times. First, we have the story of how a family dairy farm near Chicago, Minnesota, moved into the automated side of dairy farming. And for a closer look at how that farm has seen some new successes and challenges, here's a report from Laura K. Prosser. The Blackwelders have been farming their homestead in Chicago, Minnesota since 1903. But it wasn't until 1960, when the family started focusing on dairy, that the beef cattle and the pigs were weaned out and the milking parlor was brought in. Here's their story of how that parlor got an automated makeover. My grandfather, he take a big step and put a milking parlor in in 1969 and redid the barn to fit that. He just enjoyed the cows more than swine and the same was my father. They had some swine when my dad was little but he really didn't care for the hogs. So that's when we really started focusing on dairy and making that the main part of the operation. My dad redid the parlor in 1995. Um, he put new equipment in and made it larger. We took automatic takeoffs so that the parlor could sense when each cow was done milking. It wasn't us watching the flow of the milk to shot it, take it off. So the parlor took care of itself. Each unit had its own sensor and that's better for the cow's utter health. So that was a big step. But what does an automated system actually entail? What it is, it's a robotic milker. It preps the udder, um, stimulates the udder, disinfects the udder, gets it clean, and then it attaches and collects the milk for us so we aren't moving them around like we used to. When we were in the parlor, we would bring the cows to the parlor three times a day. Now the cow goes to the robot whenever she pleases. She's not milked every single time she goes to the robot, and sometimes some cows don't go to the robot as much as we'd like, so we bring them there and helping them or pushing them pretty much into the robot so they get used to it. Five years ago, we installed an automatic calf feeder our cows that weren't on the automatic feeder, they were more stubborn to go into the robot at first, but it seemed like these younger ones, they remember from being a calf that they got fed in this stall. Well, now they're in a stall, it's just larger. Other than the first milking, which when we help the robot, we do not have to touch a cow when it comes to milking. It's a more natural way. It's, it's just way better for the cow, and it also it, it's better for their produ production. We get more production out of these cows because of it. So what does this mean for an average work hand on the Blackwelder farm? Each cow has an electronic tag on the collar on its neck, and that tag has a pedometer. So if her activity goes down, it'll flag it on my computer here. And then also it has it counts her rumination, which is how many minutes a day she's eating or chewing her cud. So if she's ruminating an average of 450 minutes a day, and one day she goes down to 200, it will flag it and we can go and check the cow out. And it usually will show us she's sick before she will show visual signs of her being sick. So we catch things quicker and the sicknesses don't take as large of a toll as they would if we would have probably waited that other day before we can actually visually see that her ears are down or she's puffing. Before you can visually see a sickness, the, com the robot and the computer find it for us. So going from this system, we had went from five full-time employees to two. We cut down on our labor force um, dramatically, which is great. And what we really did is we took the three jobs that we took away. Money that we were using to pay them is now going to make the loan payments on the robots. Now, just because the farm is a little more automated than most, 
and seem straight out of the future. It doesn't mean the Blackwilder family can just sit back and let the robots do all the work. We've always, ever since I can remember, my father's always really focused on genetics and always trying to breed a better cow, a more productive, healthier animal. We've always tried to stay upbeat with technology and try to keep up with industry and not drag behind. I always look for new ways to be more productive and sustainable. A lot of people say you have robots, you don't have to work anymore. No, the only thing the robot does is milk the cows. It doesn't, it gives them a treat, but it doesn't feed them the rest of the nutrients they need. It doesn't clean the barn. You know, we're still here all the time, it seems. And with us now to discuss any other changes in the dairy industry, we have from South Dakota, Dave Skaggs, and he's with the South Dakota Department of Agriculture. And from Minnesota, we have the Associate Director of the Minnesota Milk Producers Association, Air garcia Silver. And I should mention Air is also with the Minnesota Milk Producers Association. So Dave, Air, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Air, I'd like to start with you a little bit. I know you've got Minnesota Milk and you've got the Midwest Dairy Association. So tell us a little bit about what you do with the organization. Yeah. So with Midwest Dairy Association, we really work on building sales and trust for dairy farmers. So we work um, on helping dairy farmers um, secure future marketplace for their product. So there's a lot of innovation going on with our business development team. And we also work within our schools and helping make sure that everyone really understands that getting three dairy dairy servings a day is what's really needed so dairy three for me so and then with minnesota milk we work uh, with dairy farmers specifically on helping them with educational programming to be more successful on their farms and then also uh, representing their needs at the capital in terms of legislature and programs and assistance okay great and, and dave south dakota department of agriculture and you've been there for a while and you're a specialist in dairy right Right, I have been. I've been uh, working with the Department of Ag since uh, 2005, do, came in doing the dairy uh, development specifically, and I've had the opportunity to watch it, watch the industry grow tremendously in South Dakota and, and also in the region as well. Yeah. So let's talk about trends for a bit, because I was thinking about how many people I know who may have grown up in a dairy farm or their friends run a dairy farm, but they've been away from it for a while. And, uh, you know, if you go onto a dairy farm today, things may seem very, very different. So uh, tell us about some trends that you're seeing in South Dakota for dairy farming. Well, one of the big things is I think that we're starting to see more people that have their families have left the dairy industry and, and got off into other sectors to get their education and work are now starting to trend back coming into the farm. And uh, as our dairies have continued to grow in size, it's a, you know, it's a labor issue as well. But the main thing is it's a quality of life for these people, and especially for the young ones coming back, they may have their uh, young, you know, young families, and you know, they're getting a chance to come back closer to grandma and grandpa as well yeah. and get back into the business they grew up in. Sure. And Air, I know when we were having a break there from when you talked about that you were seeing the same kind of thing in Minnesota, and in many cases it's technology that's sort of helping to enable people to come back in and partner in some ways that maybe they didn't before, right? Yeah, I think so. You know, I think that we've been seeing a lot of young people wanting to get back into the business, and they're coming back to the dairy farms, and so the utilization of technology and multifamilies working together is really helping them to be more efficient and more specialized in what they're doing. Now, I want to pick up on the multifamily part, because I know someone who was 
in a dairy farm for years once wrote an essay that called How Cows Have Ruled My Life mm -hmm. because she talked about cows and family and the fact that the dairy, in dairy farming there is this amazing commitment that people have to make 24-7. You know, you're there on the farm or it's just down the road and you've got chores morning and evening or three time a day milking, whatever it is, you've got a lot. But is the multifamily piece really what we're seeing emerge because then you have some flexibility of families and scheduling? Is that a big part of it? I think that's part of it. Um, I think that it also just helps with that specialization. You know, one family might be really interested in caring for the cows, so they focus specifically on, a, on the cows. Another family member might be specifically interested in the crops and maintaining that land for future generations. So it allows them to focus on things that they are interested in and specializing in and, and so forth. So I think that that's kind of the large part of it. I don't know, you've had some people who, you know, sort of come back to the farm, as you said, in some new ways. And well, how are people doing some of those things in South Dakota? Well, I think Eric's right on it that we have a lot of folks that are, you know, that have come back to the farm and they have their own little expertise area, whether it's taking care of baby calves. And today, as our operations continue to get larger, you also have the need for somebody to be a human resource director anymore. Uh, There's so many right rules and regulations uh, that they need to keep up on that uh, they're having to spend more time on these specialized areas. Sure, and I suppose if they were growing up on a farm and it was uh, smaller and you didn't have as, have as much help, you didn't have to worry about human resources because you were doing it all itself, but now you're looking, maybe looking at a payroll, a uh, number of people employed, and then the high specialization as well, right? Exactly. And the thing is, tech, you know, the technology is, has changed so much over the last just 10 years in the industry. And, uh, I mean, it's... You know, when you see cows that are wearing collars that, you know, keep track of their ruminations and pedometers and stuff. But it's all about cow comfort and the health of the animal and making sure that she's comfortable. Yeah. And that's, I think, one of the things that I pe think people would be most surprised about if they looked at a modern dairy farm is, is the technology changes. Mm -hmm. Because there have been so many, I mean, you mentioned pedometers. I mean, who would have thought about, <laughs> you know, a pedometer years ago, right? No, it, it's just another way of monitoring a cow's health, making sure that, uh, you know, if she's not getting in what is their average or norm, that they go take a look at her, see if she's got a sore foot, uh, uh, you know, maybe has some something, a little arthritis or whatever, starting to come into their knees and stuff, just to make sure that she's doing all right. Yeah. Now, of course, when you talk technology, of course, a lot of people might think about, oh, my gosh, that sounds expensive. Uh, because, of course, you know, people are used to anything in, in technology that it costs them, but there's also cost savings. So, you know, how, do, how does all of this technology installation affect the, the, the profits of the dairy farmers? Tell me about that. I'll start with you, Dave. Well, I think, yeah, there's always a cost associated with it, but when the cost, it can be offset by the return on the investment and the cow comfort and the material, you know, the information they're getting back out of the data to make a more informed decision on what they're going to do or how they're operating that day or the next day. So, I mean, yeah, it, it plays a role. Sure, and I expect we're also seeing, as you said, people who come back to the farm, they've you know, got the four-year degree. It could be ag marketing, could be ag economics, could be a number of things, could be some of the specialists that you talked about. So, that, so people come back with a set of fresh eyes on how to approach farming, right? Is that what it is? Yeah, they do. And, you know, I think a lot of them are more working with teams, too. You know, I see a lot of farmers gathering their lenders and their veterinarians and their nutritionists and all coming together to help them consult and figure out what's going to be the best decision for their farm. Yeah. Um, you know, since we, since we have South Dakota folks and Minnesota folks at the same table, let's talk about some state-to-state -state differences. Because, of course, um, you know, and for a lot of people that I knew in Minnesota in the dairying, it was concentrated in the eastern side of the state or the southeastern side of the state. And, you know, that was a little bit more like Wisconsin and western Minnesota. It may be a little bit more like South Dakota, but let's talk about some state-to-state -state differences. And, Dave, I know you've, you've traveled, you've done dairy research in a lot of states. So give us some perspective. Well, I can say, you know, we, yeah, we have. We've, uh, we uh, attend the World Ag Expo out in California, recruiting dairies, the same thing with going to the World Dairy Expo in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, with attending those shows, and it's not so much about recruiting cows for just South Dakota. I want to recruit cows for South Dakota. That's my number one goal. But it's about recruiting cows for the area, the region. Uh, when you sit here and you look at... <laughs> Really, there's no border difference between South Dakota and Minnesota. We have plenty of forages. We have uh, good water sources here. We have an excellent climate for cattle. 
and especially for the dairy cow. And uh, these things all work together. So as far as recruiting for South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, North Dakota, we're all pretty much in the same boat with, uh, you know, we've got advantages that other states lack today. You know, we've got water where California's in a severe drought. They've got other uh, regulations, political issues there that they have to contend with. And I think we're in a very uh, responsible and reasonable area for people to make move their families to this region or to South Dakota and basically have that quality of life, raise a family mm -hmm. and do it as a family unit. Well, and you mentioned, you mentioned California because I remember years ago someone telling me about the differences between um, like dairy farm size, for example, the average dairy farm in California where of course they have a severe water problem. Those were you know, very large farms compared to what people thought was an average size. So there were a lot of differences really between California and Minnesota and Wisconsin. Um, and, and some of those differences, I'm sure you've seen those at those national shows. People, when people have those discussions, it's, they're talking about very different worlds. Well, they are. They're two totally different worlds in that aspect. But I think the, you know, the one thing is here, you know, people have to get used to having winter. You know, we're not able to, uh, to go milk cows in shorts uh, year-round. But, you know, when, they, when these farmers and dairy producers look at it, it's all about the quality of comfort for their cattle and making sure they're doing something that they've grown up with in their life and they want to do something that uh, be independent and, you know, maintain that independence, to say, to be able to continue to dairy and to bring their children up in that aspect. Yeah, and also, too, is there also some extent that when you get a number of dairy farms, let's take, talk about, you know, like dairy corridor development, where you've got a lot of farms in an area, then I know I've heard producers say, well, you know, they're concerned about how many veterinarians do they have, because if they have a lot of cows, are there veterinarians? And if there are other farms in a region and you have a dairy development in a region, suddenly other things start to happen, right? Well, this is true, uh, you know, the talking to the University of Minnesota and, and Iowa about the number of vet graduates that they're having. Mm -hmm. You know, they may have 20, 25, 30 students that graduate, but they only have two or three that are trained to be large animal vets. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to say Minnesota's got a great asset here with the uh, Davis family with, and their, I forget the name of the, uh, the farm, but uh, working with the vet school to provide that training for large animal vets, it's, it's a huge asset. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Air, your perspective? Yeah, I think that um, here in Minnesota, we are very unique and, and I think special that we have a very diverse industry. I know uh, the Minnesota Milk Producers Association recently took a tour to New Zealand mm. last year. And one of the comments that some of the dairy farmers made was that um, how diverse we are in Minnesota, how we have all different sizes and that we have so many different styles Whereas in New Zealand, it's mostly grazing and, and just one style. And so, and I think with that also lends lots of infrastructure that we have available to us, just like in South Dakota with plentiful land and, and looking at trends coming forth with needing to feed 9 billion people in the future, we have the resources here in the Midwest to do that. And that makes it, I think, really special. Well, and there also see, you know, very regional variations, of course, as you mentioned, South Dakota compared to California, but even then within the region, for example, if you get closer to the Twin Cities, you may see more people doing, you know, artisanal cheeses or not necessarily doing the fluid milk, but doing the manufactured and doing some of those other projects. What's, what's, can, tell me a little bit about what's happening in that area. Yeah, well, you know, I don't, know all of it, but sure. I know a few, some of it. So yeah, we have some of our farms that are looking at doing on-farm processing. So the artisanal cheeses, um, we have one in southeastern Minnesota and one in central Minnesota, and they've been quite successful with that. And so developing that niche market and, and developing that for their families and their success. Yeah, and is that a little, tends to be sort of probably a can be a multi-family thing as well. You've got lots of families who may have a particular interest. And again, one may have a specialty in cheese making, another may be the one who really cares about the calves. Right. And mm -hmm. so you're seeing lots of different family members sort of taking a niche role, perhaps based on their own education. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the expansion and how people move you know, through dairy farms and, and what sort of success leads to expansion. Because clearly, you know, you know, the number of cows that a farmer has has grown up a lot. So I'd like to talk about that a little bit. And, and Dave, from your perspective, you know, what is it that makes sort of that expansion and success possible as, as people look at, at dairy farm development? Well, I think, you know, when you, you, you look at it, the efficiency of the cow today, uh, 10 years ago, the South Dakota stats where we averaged about 110 cows to a dairy farm. Today we're just up over 400 and 
about 440 head of cows is, is what our average is per grade A dairy. And, but the thing is, when you sit there and you look at what's been taking place in the industry is these farms are going to continue to grow in size. You're going to get more production. You know, cows were only at a 14,000 pound herd average 10 years ago. Today we're at 23,000 pounds. So when I started, we were on a, 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 a hunt for 65,000 more cows to come into our state to meet the needs that our dairy processing plants had, uh, you know, budgeted for expansion plants. And we were able to do that with adding 30,000 cows, but we doubled our milk production. So we're, we're at capacity right now until we get more processing in our state. Much the same in Minnesota in terms of the, what it takes for people to expand and grow. It's, it sounds like it's a mixture of things. It sounds like it's having the plants, having the cows, having all the pieces, right? Yeah, you know, I think it's the same in Minnesota. I think what, again, it's up to each individual farm and what's right for them and caring for their cows, their land, and their families. And so I think that uh, we want to see all sizes succeed in, in that. And, yes, the trends are, are varying there. But it's really... Um, what's going to be right for that family and what they need. And I think that there's a lot of variables that go into that when making that decision. Yeah. Quality control is something that I, I find fascinating when you look at, at dairy farming because, of course, as you, whether you're a small farmer or a large farmer, however that may be defined, there's always an aspect of, you know, how do you maintain the quality? Because, of course, we're talking about a product that people really love and they're concerned about it and quality control you know, whether it's technology or whether it's, you know, the discipline of, of a particular approach, the quality control is really important. So, Dave, what's happening with quality control in dairy, and what is that like? You know, quality control is a huge issue, and it has gotten better over the years as, as uh, new technology comes about. Here again, technology plays a role in it. But uh, with uh, more dairies using sand bedding, different types of bedding that it's all about making the cow comfortable. Once the cow is comfortable, you can eliminate so many of those other factors that do affect quality. As long as you're providing her good, clean water, good forages, and making sure that she has plenty of time to rest in clean beds, it goes a long ways. Yeah. Yeah. And in Minnesota? Yeah, I think it's the same thing. I think that quality really stems in three areas. You know, the first, as Dave was talking about, is in regards to cow care. And I know that many of our farms are utilizing the National Farm, Farmers Assuring Responsible Management Program, to help make, make sure that that happens. And I think the second area of quality is really in the, in the resources that we're providing and the feed and the land that we're taking care of. And so using our, our manure as an organic fertilizer then back for um, the land for future generations. And the third, as you said, is just making sure that that milk that's leaving the farm is of the highest quality for you and others enjoying it on their tables. You mentioned the word organic in your answer there, and that, of course, leads me to the question of organic, because we've seen interest in that from consumers. And what about the organic business, uh, uh, era in terms of organic and if someone has been in a, a, a non-organic farm and they want to make that transition to organic, how does that work for them? Well, I'm not a specialist in that area, but I know that it's much like, you know, the other systems where they want to first and foremost take the greatest care of their cows and also then the land and and their families. And so I know that they just have different rules that they have to abide by in terms of the feed that they're providing their animals and also um, how they're caring for their animals. Dave? Well, I agree there. We've, we've been working with a couple of different organic producers and it's, you know, at first I thought it was a niche market, but it's a definite permanent market that's going to play a huge role in continuation of the dairy industry. Uh, we've currently got a couple of herds under development that are looking at being organic. Uh, you know, you have to have organic feeds and it, it's about a three year process to get certified to uh, have your land be certified organic so that you have that organic feed to go into your cattle. Sure. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it's a process. It takes time and, and with that comes a cost. Oh, yeah. But uh, I think these guys are, that are looking at it are serious about making sure they're doing the right thing. Well, I think they'd have to be, you know, because again, you're, you're taking a leap of faith. You mentioned three years there. So when you, when you go down that road, you know, you've got three years before you get to the certification process and then you're really in that world. So, I mean, I would think that transition could be, could be pretty challenging. That, that seems like a long time. It's a long time, and, but they have rules, and if you want to be 
selling an organic product. You need to follow the rules and, and get yourself ready for it. Sure. We just got a couple of minutes left, so I'd just like to, to say, you know, uh, in the last, oh, you know, last few reports we've heard about the business, of course, that, you know, there have been a lot of changes in the last year, you know, milk prices were down. Um, what are some other sort of changes that we think we might see ahead in the world of dairy farming, and let's just say in the next couple of years? Dave? Well, I think you're going to continue to see technology play a huge role in it. And again, it's not going to be just strictly with what's taking place in the cow herd and monitoring equipment and, you know, the nutrition. Uh, I mean, my goodness, the recipes that they make for these dairy cows today are so specific. They're like your mom's chocolate co <laughs> chip cookie recipe, you know. They're pretty detailed. And I think you're going to continue to see uh, strides made in that and just making sure that, you know, genetics is another big role. Um, you know, we're seeing more and more advancements in the uh, artificial insemination on the dairy cows and, and where they're going with that and how much butter fat and protein are going into the milk. Uh, Eric, your perspective? Yeah, I would agree. I think it's just being more efficient and utilizing the technology and the resources available to help those farms make the best decision for them in the future. I think that as the next generation comes back, you know, there's just that desire and that hunger for the technology and the new, new opportunities out there that I think that we'll continue to see more changes and more innovation than we can ever imagine. Wow. Exciting note to end on. Eric Garcia Silver and Dave Skaggs, thank you very much for joining us today on Compass. Thank you. That's it for this week on Compass. Join us next week as we head out to Milan, Minnesota to explore the world of deep winter greenhouses.